Welcome to the Anxious Love Coach Podcast, a place for creating meaningful, conscious, secure, long-term partnerships. Here, we talk relationship anxiety and creating healthy, magnetic dynamics within partnership to help you feel confident and alive within committed partnership. My name is Natalie Kennedy, and I'm your host. I'm a relationship anxiety coach and meditation teacher. I've worked with hundreds of clients battling anxiety, and after experiencing extraordinary shifts in my own healing relative to partnership, now combine my lived personal experience and professional training to help others trust themselves within relationship and in their lives. I've been to the edge and back with my now husband from relationship anxiety and come out confidently to the other side. I want to pass the tools I've learned along to you to help you trust yourself in relationships and also create magnetic, hot dynamics with your partner. I believe lots of mainstream relationship advice today can make us anxious and dissatisfied. So let's jump in and normalize challenges that modern relationships and real people go through while also giving you tools to trust yourself, drop the shame, and alchemize your messy, twisted relational truths into profound inner wisdom and aliveness. If you haven't yet, be sure to join my communities over on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Anxious Love Coach. You can also request a 30-minute relationship anxiety assessment with me depending on availability or ask me a question over on my website at www.anxiouslovecoach.com. I've also got a wonderful relationship anxiety meditation available to you as thanks for subscribing to my email list. Thanks for being here and enjoy this episode. Today's episode is a very tender and juicy one. I am bringing on a very special guest who is a dear mentor and friend of mine, and her name is Shayna Hiller. In this episode, she and I are going to be discussing anxiety and sex. I remember when I was struggling dearly with relationship anxiety, I used to really dread having sex with my partner, now husband, whom I've been with for almost 12 years. It was so bad that I would completely avoid it, and every time we would get into bed, I would be so afraid that he was going to initiate because I just had so much ick and revulsion and dread and disgust, but at the same time, I felt really guilty because I knew I wasn't meeting my partner's physical intimacy needs. And if you looked a little bit deeper under the surface, I was completely disconnected from my body and my pleasure, and I had no idea where to start when it came to sex as an adult in a really complicated world that was very fast-paced. Now, my friend Shayna Hiller is a integrative nutrition health coach. She is a Tao Tantric priestess trained in the shamanic arts, as well as a feminine embodiment practitioner. Believe it or not, last year I was certified by her in at her Embodied Wisdom Academy. So I have a lot to say about Shayna, and I recommend her highly if you are interested in pursuing the route of Tantra and women's sexuality and embodiment. So today she and I will be talking all about sex anxiety and what causes it and what you can do about it. I also want to preface that at the end of this episode, she and I will be sharing an upcoming event that we have coming up in the episode, we named it the Sex Anxiety Masterclass, but since then and before I'm recording this intro, we've actually renamed it to the Sex Anxiety Clinic because we want it to sound more of a, mm, I guess, interactive, embodied thing. It's not just going to be a lecture. So just stay tuned for that. Know that we're going to be selling you an event after that. And also I want to showcase Shayna's retreat and training that she has coming up this year, the very same one that I went to last year and got certified at. I loved it. It was amazing. So when I found out that Shayna was running it again, I wanted to tell you guys about it. So just know that we're going to be selling you some stuff at the end of this. And um, if you don't do anything and you just listen to this episode, you're going to get plenty out of it. But if you do end up coming to our masterclass that's coming up or our clinic, as I should say, I think you're going to have a great time. And without further ado, enjoy. And here is Shayna. Thank you so much for coming on today. It is my deepest pleasure. I'm so grateful to be here with you. I'm so grateful too. How are you? I am really good right now. I'm feeling just so, uh, so ready, so ready to, to be here and be on and share. Maybe part of that is because we had a little tune in just before this uh, this recording, and I've been on this high for the past week or so. Uh, Valentine's week, which you know is is can be a lot of things for a lot of people, but I've had the privilege of 
um, helping a lot of humans in the realm of mastering the art and skill of love and self-love this week. So I'm feeling just very, I want to say, nourished and filled up and humbled and grateful. And uh, and I just had some coffee, so I'm also <laughs> vibing on the caffeine. So whoop, it's whoop. a mix of magic. <laughs> That that is very magical, and thank you for sharing. And uh, yes, to to bringing the art of love into the month of February, and mm -hmm. and March, and April, and May, and June, and all yeah, those. Yeah, yeah, every every yeah. month. Yeah. So, uh, I think we'll we'll start out today talking a little bit about your background, and today we're going to be talking a lot about sex anxiety and working with dread in the bedroom. And we're also going to lead that into to a beautiful offering that Shana and I are going to be having next month. And, um, and also a beautiful offering that I think the world should know about that Shana is working on. So we'll be talking about both of those at the end. But for now, we'll, we'll kind of set up a nice foundation of who Shana is. Maybe it's your first or second time hearing about Shana and Personally, I've known Shana for, I feel uh, something like 10 years. I feel yeah. like that long. Yeah. And we have really evolved together. So to, to watch you enter the space of Tantra and women's sexuality, it's very powerful. And there's lots, lots, lots for Shana to share related to sex, related to anxiety, related to trauma and shame. All of these things are interconnected. And I think it might be nice before we start talking about what sex anxiety is and how it's created and how to work with it. If we can just know a little bit, Shana, about your background and how you got into this work. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, well, I've been teaching yoga for 17 years, got into yoga when I was in college and became an avid uh, yoga and meditation practitioner and teacher. And uh, I mean, I, this is before yoga was as popular and widespread as it is these days. So it's been very interesting going into yoga when I was in, in college and uh, my parents, you know, being very concerned with me of like, what are you going to do with your life? Because this was not, again, it wasn't mainstream yet. And uh, I was very, uh, what do you want to say? Yoga is a very disciplined path. Uh, not just, you know, if you think of yoga, you think of stretching or doing things in a yoga studio. But for me, I was really uh, interested in the philosophy and that side of things as well. Uh, during this time, I also was struggling with an eating disorder, which I have to say, I don't know why. I'm just going to put that out there. I don't know why that happened. Of course, in retrospect, now that I've evolved, I can look back and see, oh, wow, there is a chance that my eating disorder, which again was happening at the time of being deeply, deeply entrenched in my yogic studies, could have been due to sexual trauma that I wasn't actually aware of, but my logical conscious mind would never have gone there. So I didn't really I didn't really put the two and two together until actually way more recently. So I continued with my yoga teaching, my yoga studies. And during this whole time, again, I was meditating, traveling to India, uh, you know, eating organic food, doing all the things that on paper seemed to be very healthy, but I was struggling internally. I had tremendous anxiety. I had insomnia and during this entire time, which mind you was my entire twenties, I was single and celibate. Now, someone might say, wow, that's so cool. We practiced celibacy. Yeah, I think I hid under the excuse or justification uh, of purity in yoga, that somehow my celibacy was uh, a sign of being enlightened or being on that path when in reality, deep down, I had tremendous, tremendous, overwhelming fear of intimacy. And if I were to dig even deeper, I had tremendous fear of myself. And I think that that is what was corresponding to me constantly trying to make myself smaller in all the ways. And so my life revolved around how little can I get? How much can I control my surroundings? 
uh, so that I feel like I have a sense of control around my life. And again, you know, I, I didn't have like one major traumatic event that I could that I could logically you know, remember or point to that set this all in motion. But what I will say is that it was definitely a downward spiral for uh, for many years. And I was kind of at rock bottom in the sense of physically, I was uh, at 67 pounds and uh, completely no libido, completely no emotions. You know, when your physical body gets to a certain weight, um, many non-essential functions start to shut down. And that is definitely physical pleasure and emotional, emotional feeling, the sensory system. So I felt like a robot going through life. And it was very difficult for me to come back into, let's say, my body, because I had I had left, I had dissociated deeply. And during this time, though, which is very interesting and almost miraculous, you know, I had come across many different teachers and mentors and beings in my life who would just drop a nugget of wisdom or a little nugget of guidance here and there. And I was reading books at this time. This is when, again, I was very deeply into my yogic studies. So some of my yoga books were tantra books, right? I had just this huge mm -hmm. array of books. And I started reading some of these tantra books where you know, tantra, I want to say the essence of tantra is acceptance, the essence of Tantra is self-love. Tantra says yes to the body. It says yes to our sexuality. It says yes to our senses. It says yes to our emotions. It says yes to the shadow. It says yes to the light. It is a path of self-love, I want to say, and, and true acceptance. And anytime I would read these books, even though it was just reading, because I tend to think that, well, reading is such an intellectual thing. It's not an embodied act. But for me at that time, when I was struggling so much, that was my solace. That was my healing. I would sometimes fall asleep in the midst of intense bouts of insomnia. The only way I would fall asleep was reading these books about Tantra that soothed my soul. There was something in them where I yearned to be able to free myself from these self-imposed chains that I had you know, created essentially in my own being. And so slowly, slowly, I started moving in this direction of, of love, essentially, of, of learning about the difference between, I want to say, yoga, which, again, the more philosophical aspect of it is a path of suppression with awareness, uh, and tantra, which is a path of indulgence with awareness, and started to really see my body as a temple to start to come back down to earth, to start to re-inhabit myself and um, start to process uh, the trauma, essentially, and clear the shame that had been preventing me from understanding my power as a woman, my power as a creative being, my power as a leader, uh, and as a human being, or should I say, as a spiritual being having a human experience. And it's it's impossible <laughs> in my uh, deep, deep opinion and knowingness to fully experience the profound insights, self-realization, um, oneness, peace of mind that that yoga promises without um, learning how to be in our bodies fully. So I also, just to layer this on, during this time of celibacy, um, no self-pleasure either. So it's not like I was just restraining from being with other people. I was also restraining from being with myself. I mean, I didn't even think of it because at the time that was like filled with shame. There was no need for that. I was literally moving just from the neck up. And I also did not get my period for those entire 10 years. So in a sense, I didn't even know what I was missing because I wasn't connected to nature. I didn't even comprehend. And this is common for the women that I work with and speak with, but I really just didn't comprehend the importance of being connected with the cycle, the cycle of the moon. I didn't know anything about it. In fact, I thought it was a burden beforehand when I was actually still getting my period in my early, in you know, my late teens and my very, very early twenties, if even, I thought it was a burden. So when I wasn't getting my period, I said, wow, this is good. I don't have to deal with all that blood. 
Uh, so I was very, 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 insert 1000 berries, disconnected from my body. But I also was so strong willed in my mind that I did not and would not allow myself to even think that it was a problem or an issue until I was near death, <laughs> truly, and something needed to shift. And people ask all the time, what was that? What was that moment? You know, what was that moment when you decided to re inhabit your body or come back or heal, essentially? And, you know, it was, it was really not just one moment, it was a bunch of little moments. It was, whispers of my intuition. It was, as mentioned, there's been beings coming into my life. The more I exposed myself to new teachings, the more things started to just click into place. And I made a conscious choice to, uh, to come back into the world. You know, when I moved to LA in 2013, before I moved to LA, I was contemplating shaving my head and moving to a monastery in Japan to become a monk because that felt like it went along with my lifestyle at the time. It felt like a convenient excuse to just, you know, kind of check out of, of reality. Um, and lo and behold, I ended up in Los Angeles doing exactly the opposite of that. Um, and that's because of an inner voice that knew that I needed to learn how to be in this world and be in my body as a spiritual practice. And it's, it's, I feel like I'm still at the tip of the iceberg and I just didn't know what I didn't know. First of all, about um, embodiment, self-love. And I don't just mean like going and get yourself a manicure or a massage or buying yourself flowers. I mean about like knowing your body so deeply and allowing pleasure to be mm, perceived as healing, as a healing force, just as you would broccoli <laughs> as physical <laughs> pleasure to actually um, start to move as as creative energy as um, empowerment and so it's my I want to say it feels like a karmic assignment it is my pleasure it is my dharma to teach uh, women and all beings really I have to say but right now my focus is on women to help women remember the inherent wisdom that resides within their body and to learn how to cultivate their energy, their creative energy to support whatever it is they desire to receive in their lives. Whatever that is to, you know, nourish healthy relationships, to call in divine partnership, to heal uh, any type of physical imbalances, to support their career, their business, their authenticity, find their voice and just be their sovereign selves. So that's the long-winded story, but there's a longer story and I'll just leave it at that for now. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing, Shana. And there were so many pieces on there that I just wanted to grab and launch into a whole new episode on each of those pieces. There were <laughs> 10 potential episodes in there. <laughs> yep. Thank yep. you so much. One of the things that stood out to me that I just wanted to acknowledge was my appreciation for how you mentioned your eating disorder. To this day, you don't know for sure what caused it. I think that's a really validating thing to say, because sometimes we don't know why we have certain compulsions or certain patterns. It's just, and, and we don't, from what I'm understanding is you don't necessarily need to know the exact reason before you can start to work with it and heal. And I, I think that is so liberating because when we first learn that trauma exists, we almost need to patho pathologize. Is that, that's the word, right? That's, that's a word I struggle. That's a word that I struggle to have roll off the tongue. Um, <laughs> but I think a lot of us, myself included, uh, we tend to want to pathologize every little pattern that we have, and we ha want to bring it back to one certain event or one certain thing. And while that can be helpful, I think uh, sometimes we can use it to stay so much in the past and and not realize how much healing is available in this moment and what's possible in the future. So. Thank you for saying that. And um, as someone who has attended multiple of your trainings, and my most recent one was last year in Bali, you know, I, I became an embodied wisdom facilitator through your program. And let me just say it, it's like you don't go in expecting so many different things in your life to fall into place when you begin this work. Maybe you go in for one specific issue and then 
you come out and you realize that that healing that one thing healed all the things and it uh, your program amplified the amount of money i was making in my business with less effort um it made me find pockets of pleasure in my body that i didn't even know could exist um it made me more magnetic to my partner he started doing more things around the house that i didn't even ask him to do like right now i was late to this podcast because my husband decided to make guacamole but not <laughs> not that that's like <laughs> something to, you know, there's That's a big deal. That's a big it's deal. a big deal. Like there are bigger <laughs> deals, but like th this man has started cooking and, you know, obviously it's of his own free will, but I do think that when we become more magnetic as women, we, we, what is the word I'm thinking? We emanate a mm. vibe or an energy that is inspiring to the people around us. And we, almost call people into being their best selves because we're somehow embodying an energy that people are really hungry for. So, you know, yeah. this episode is, is so much more than sex anxiety. Sex anxiety is a lot of times or sex anxiety or relationship anxiety. And I actually think they go together. And a lot of, a lot of times, if you have relationship anxiety, you have sex anxiety too, and you have dread in the bedroom and, and, and you're not connected to your body. You're consumed with what ifs and staying in your head um, that's the thing that gets us in. That's the portal that mm -hmm. says, Hey, it's time to go within. You're looking in all the wrong places for your aliveness and your pleasure. Yeah. The, this sex anxiety, relationship anxiety is the initiation, Yeah. but there's many ways to be initiated from what it sounds like, you know, your eating disorder might've been yours. <laughs> oh, um, for sure. one of them anyway. Yeah. And I just think it's really beautiful that the thing that brings us into this work can heal the sex anxiety, the relationship anxiety, and so much more because that pattern is generally not only showing up in your, in the bedroom. It's probably showing that shame that affects your sex life. It probably affects your friendships with other women. It probably affects your career and your ability to ask for more. It probably affects your relationship to food. It probably reflects in your relationship to exercise yeah. uh, and self-care. So you come in looking for a solution to one thing, but you end up realizing how it's all very connected and coming from the same place. Very well said. Absolutely. Yeah. And mm -hmm. especially the, especially, you know, anything around the body, right. And control and f food, yeah. especially and sex, um, these are very, very root chakra oriented aspects of our being. And, you know, food sustains the body and sex creates the body. So even though there was no, let's say, pinpointed origin, at least logically, and that could also be a safety mechanism from my nervous system that's blocking me from a painful memory in the past, um, I, I'm pretty sure now, as mentioned in retrospect, looking back, there's something around a deep, deep shame of actually being a woman that I kind of came into this world with. Um, and of course, societal pressures and the way in which we are educated or not <laughs> around sexuality uh, definitely plays a role in feeling like something is inherently wrong, if I am to feel sexual or aroused, especially at a young age, because I will mm -hmm. say I mm -hmm. was turned on. I was a turned on 12 year old and maybe even earlier than that. And what do you think? I was slut shamed for the majority of my yep. life. Like that was that was me. And so, and that was but way before I had any type of eating disorder. I was totally in my pleasure. I was just following my body. And then I started to learn that, oh, that's wrong. I'm wrong. My inherent pleasure that's running through my body, which is my creative energy, our sexual energy is our creative energy. And it's really important to widen our scope of how we relate with, understand, and perceive this very, I want to say, innocent and basic energy that's running through all of us. That's where we all came from. But I put a lid on it because I allowed other people's judgments and perceptions and societal perceptions as well to basically make me wrong for having desire and for 
for for feeling joy uh, and pleasure in my body. So I think that also uh, definitely contributed to the the food thing and the eating disorder because I was also cutting myself off from pleasure. I didn't trust myself. I didn't trust mm -hmm. myself. I didn't know how to handle this energy moving through me. So it was easier to just cut it off completely and just be a robot. And that makes sex in the bedroom with another person and with ourselves very challenging because sex well, is very not disappointing, disappointing and dissatisfying. Yeah. And then, yes. you know, if you're not, if you're not allowed to take charge of your own pleasure, if you're not allowed to, you know, give yourself pleasure, and I don't necessarily mean pleasure in the sense of sexual, but there's, there's many pleasures that are not sexual. Yes. But if, if, if we have shame around pleasure itself, then we may inherently uh, seek out experiences that don't put us in the spot to be demanding or even have needs whatsoever. Yeah. And then one day, you know, you enter a partnership with a potentially beautiful, safe human who doesn't know how to pleasure you and they can attempt to pleasure you, but it's not satisfying because they don't know you better than you know yourself. <laughs> yep. And, but at the same time, you'll find yourself disappointed because they never quite get to the spot that you want, but you don't even know what you like. And if you did, you don't know how to articulate it. And all of a sudden, one day you decide that you don't like sex at all. When the reality is, it's not that you don't like sex. It's just, you don't like the sex that you're having and something needs to change. Yeah. And I think this work, you know, wake wakes us up to asleep parts of ourselves that need attention and bring them back online. And we can, it's, it's very scary, um, to start to wake up your sexuality after potentially a decade or more or decades mm. of just having no connection to your body whatsoever. Um, yeah. and I'll speak for myself cause you know, we are, this is a sex anxiety podcast. So I, I want to speak to it. I remember when I was really young, also around age 12, I was a ravenous slut and I mean it in a good way. Like I didn't mm -hmm. actually sleep with anyone, but the energy was very sexual and I was very turned on. Um, my body was very turned on and I also got those same messages. Um, mm -hmm. and I didn't even think much of them until, um, later when I'd actually come out of the the corporate world. I worked in a corporate office. I went to university to study pharmacy and then I went into like pharmacy corporate for a few years and my sex drive completely disappeared during that time. I was I'd already been with Preston for a few years by then. And it was so sad to me because I was 23. This is not an age to lose your libido. I felt so sure. much shame around it and I think that this, it's not that I got slut shamed in the corporate world, but there was kind of this underlying message that I didn't matter and my needs didn't matter. And I was a number and a part of a system. And my job was to basically create pleasure for someone else financially. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it didn't matter. I remember I had, um, this is before I went to Institute for Integrative Nutrition, which is where you went also and recommended mm -hmm. me to go. But I remember this is when I started to develop IBS. So I had a, di I didn't have an eating disorder, but I had a, a gut dysbiosis issue. And I just remember eating so healthy. I was really into cooking. I was eating quinoa and kale and chia seeds and all these things that are superfoods. And my meals were meticulously calculated and uh, inevitably I would binge at the end of the weekend, right? Yeah. But I was eating very healthy during the week and bringing my Tupperware to the office. And, um, if I ate any pizza, I felt so ashamed and not only that, but I let's be vulnerable for a moment. I, I shared a cubicle with somebody with another woman and no matter what I ate, Shana, I got so much gas. I would be yep. so bloated and yep. I couldn't like leave the cubicle because I had to be at my computer and someone was watching my every move to make sure I wasn't getting up. And I actually got in trouble for walking around too much. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Cause I just hate, I, I, I like, I have to move. I have to move my body, but that impulse to move my body got squashed. 
Mm. And my stomach was the one that protested with gas and bloating. And I would like be unbuttoning my pants, but hoping no one would see it because I would be so bloated. And I would be literally holding in my farts, Shayna, for like hours at a time. Oh, no. And then, and then one day I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to have sex with my partner anymore because I just feel so gross. And it makes sense. Again, you don't know it in the moment why you're not feeling attracted to your partner. You think, oh, and Preston's got his own career. That's very stressful. Yeah. So we're yeah. both really stressed out. We're both not putting ourselves first. We're both mentally trying to override our bodies constantly. And then boom, one day you don't feel like having sex with each other. And if you take that immediate like dread, that immediate ick at face value, you're going to think you're maybe not compatible. And we went through this for a good five years, even after I quit the corporate office and started teaching yoga and going into nutrition at that time, my body was, the damage had been done. It yeah. took me several years to heal my digestion again and and be free from acid reflux and IBS and all of that stuff. Right. But I remember that I would have so much anxiety in the bedroom because my husband and I, we would, or Press and I at the time, we were boyfriend and girlfriend, um, we had so much, we, we dealt with our stress in different ways. I dealt with it by avoiding sex. I did not want to be touched. I didn't want to be, I didn't want someone, a yet another person to need something from me. And for me, that's yeah. what, where the sex anxiety was coming from. Preston was relieving his stress through, as many men do, through ejaculation and porn at the time. And I understand completely why he turned to that. It makes total sense. Um, and so, you know, him wanting to stay monogamous, he would reach over and try to get his needs met with my body, understandably. And me having been kind of, De been demanded of all day long in my career, the, the last thing I wanted was, was for someone to use my body, especially if it wasn't being done in a conscious way. And so he was kind of you know, unconsciously looking to me to satisfy him. Mm. And I was unconsciously looking to him to fill me up emotionally where, because I couldn't, I didn't set any boundaries. And yeah. I would, I would argue that 12 years, 10 years later, we're it's not that we we have an we have a wonderful sex life for the most part, depending on circumstances. But if we have the space to, it's really lovely. But it took a lot of unlearning of what sex is supposed to look like and feel like, and what it's yeah. really about. It's it's not what's in the movies. It's not what's in the porn. And I think so much dread and anxiety that is coming up around sex specifically is the fact that we have all these expectations and um, unmet needs going on in the shadows yeah specifically by ourselves we we aren't willing to put ourselves first to the point where you can offer yourself to someone in a vulnerable way anyway so that's my kind of long long-winded rant I, I felt called to share also oh, it's so beautiful well you touched on so much in terms of you know the root of the many different roots of where sex anxiety can stem from and I can totally relate with so many of them and and you you mentioned that you know it's it's not like it is in the movies and that's at, or in porn for example you know and I like to pose this question uh, to people who you know I'm teaching around these topics of like where where did you learn about mm. sexuality so, so, some of us were fortunate enough to maybe have a a conscious education from our parents or our caregivers but I know for me it was porn or uh, you know, sex ed in school. Like I don't even oh my God. Know. like basically um, don't do it or you will die. <laughs> that uh, was, or you'll get pregnant <laughs> or you'll get pregnant. Exactly. Something bad will happen or you're going to get pregnant. So avoid it at all costs. And so, you know, we are, we are conditioned societally speaking to either, you know, fear it or it's, you know, it's, it is such a powerful force and it, makes perfect sense. And this is why I like to normalize having anxiety around this because I mentioned this earlier, but we all know that sex is not a head thing. It's not a mind thing. So, you know, to move into sex consciously, and I love that you mentioned the word consciously, um, first and foremost requires that we feel safe. We feel safe with who we're with. Um, the most important piece you also touched on, again, a thousand nuggets of magic and what you shared 
Uh, I, I had a teacher once, forget exactly who it was, but it was someone magical uh, who said, you are responsible for your own pleasure. Mm. You are responsible for your own orgasm, actually, is what they said. Um, meaning that the most important piece on this journey of sharing intimacy in this way um, with another and getting your needs met, so to speak, is to know what you like and to have the courage to ask for what you want, not necessarily in a demanding way, not shaming the other person for not knowing how to do it right, because every single body is a mystery. It's, you know, we're we're not all the same map and it's an incredible mystery and an erotic, you know, there's an incredible erotic potential in every single body. And the first things first is to start to unwind our perceptions around pleasure in and of itself, to start to zoom out and say, okay, am I putting sexuality into the shadows? And of course, there's so much in religion and society that connects the word sexuality with something sinful. So this is the first, I want to say, order of of business is to start to look at um can you even imagine putting the word sacred and sexuality into the same sentence because that is essentially what the teachings of tantra are pointing to that this very same energy that creates life is can be used to create so much and to connect on such a deep level and to share intimacy with, with another person on a level, again, when it's conscious where, and you've probably heard this, maybe, maybe not, intimacy broken down into me, I see. Mm -hmm. When I can share all of me with another person, when I feel safe to be in that space, um, I actually am faced with a mirror and I am coming into deeper contact with myself, which can be very scary. Uh, and very enlightening at the same time and very healing at the same time. So that's something that I just like to plant as a seed of what would it be like to consider just in your mind for now that, wow, maybe this act that has been so, I want to say manipulated and um, just misconstrued and misunderstood and just taken advantage of in society is actually one of the most pure and purely innocent forces that when we are in our full sexual power as individuals, we cannot be controlled. We can create, we can co-create in a way that, as you mentioned earlier, we can create with more ease and less effort because mm -hmm. we're not just using our minds anymore. We are using our entire body and we know how to circulate this energy, the journey. So I think why also, you know, meditation and sexuality or meditation and Tantra go together is because let's face it in meditation. What is one of the goals? If there is a goal, uh, the goal is to kind of transcend or connect with something other than our mind. It's not necessarily to stop the mind to stop. The mind is like trying to stop the wind from blowing, but is to connect with different aspects of ourselves so there's a journey in sex from the mind down to the heart and then all the way down to the sex center that when we are in busy lives, when we, like you mentioned, like you, Preston has a business as well. You have your business as well. There's a lot going on. And I like that you mentioned that it's okay and it's normal at times in relationships to go through an ebb and flow with your sex life and know that it takes, I want to say, dedication and effort sometimes, which might seem contraindicatory, whereas, wait, mm -hmm. I thought that all of a sudden we're just going to glance at each other and our bodies are magnetically going to come together. And we're going to start making out and it's going to turn into this magical sex fest. Because no. you're twin flames and it's yeah. just natural and easy if you find the right person. No, you may have to schedule <laughs> it. We, we right. schedule, my partner and I, we actually schedule sex. And if we don't schedule it, it doesn't happen. And guess what? Sometimes when we schedule it, I'm not in the mood. And another oh. one of my teachers, yeah, this is big. One it's of my true. teachers said, uh, normal people, this is a quote from Margot Anon. She's one of the pioneer Tantra teachers who's in her 80s now and is like so vital because she's super connected to her sexual energy. Um, she said, normal people make love when they feel like it. 
tantricas change the way they feel through the act of making love. Wow. So we see it as that much of a priority, just as drinking your green juice, just as going for your hike or doing your yoga or meditating or whatever it is that you do for your personal well-being, we schedule it in because it's through that act of and foreplay and again, knowing your pleasure and slowing things down. There's so many ways to, I want to say, combat and transform sex anxiety into something that actually feels really soothing and supportive for the nervous system, where with carving out that time and space and shifting to a different way of relating with sexuality, um, you actually can transform your mood through that mm. act. You know, have you ever felt like that? God, I don't really feel like going to the gym today, <laughs> but notice how you feel when you, you push yourself, not in a way of, um, you know, self-torture, but in a way of there's, there's something, there's a higher wisdom there that knows that this is important. And once you're done, wow, oh my gosh, I feel so amazing. So that's something to consider too. It's not always about just doing it when you feel like it. If I just worked on my business when I felt like it, or if I just, you know, had sex when I felt like it, um, it's a journey, especially if you carry or have carried shame or um, the sex, you know, is so taboo, or you find yourself rushing just to get it over with, this might feel like an extra effort in the beginning. And I can guarantee you, eventually it will shift and you will start to crave it because it is like another form of food. And guess what? When we are sexually satisfied, we were, we are connected with our true sexuality. Again, this is not just having sex. And you mentioned the word conscious. This is, first of all, coming in contact with yourself. This is solo or with a partner. You may find, like I found, that there's less cravings for the physical food because I am actually satisfied in my body through my own sexual energy. I'm not looking for something secondary mm -hmm. as a form of 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 pleasure. I'm not seeking outside of myself anymore. I know how to cultivate it from within. And this energy, especially, you know, I, I teach like a blend of Tantra and Taoism and in shamanic Chinese medicine, sexual energy is our vital energy. It is the energy that keeps us young. It keeps our skin glowing. It supports organ function, immune system function, hormonal balance. It is essential for our physical health. Pleasure is part of our physical health. Why haven't we been taught this? Mm -hmm. Why? Yes. So yeah. it's, you know, I think it's time. All sorts of theories on that. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. I don't even need to get into that right now, but I'm sure you can just wonder, just be in that curiosity of, huh, I wonder why, because when I look outside at the hummingbirds and the butterflies and the flowers, right? I see sensuality all around. I see innocence. I see joy. I see playfulness. I see sex. I see creativity. I see sweetness. Mm, so there's something here that um, it's the root. I believe that sexual trauma or um, as mentioned, uh, just the conditioning around sexuality for the majority of us, I'll speak, generally speaking, is the root because it is the root. And there's so much, especially for women, trauma or shame, even being called a slut one time can actually get stuck in the body, which can compromise our creativity. It can cause stress and anxiety because all of these energies live in the gut. In Chinese medicine, your stomach, spleen, and pancreas is associated with feelings of worry and anxiousness. And so imagine if getting in touch with our sexuality in a way that feels, you know, kind of like a meditation, right? Could actually even heal gut issues, can empower oh, us. hundred percent, hundred percent. And as All someone connected. who, um, it was me for, very helpful for me um, this past year in 2023 to have done your training. And actually I got recently diagnosed last year with endometriosis and one thing that was so helpful for me in, in studying it was just how, you know, the symptoms show up in the uterus. Yes. But it's also connected to 
your hormones, which is connected to other organs that are not the uterus, like the liver, for instance. And I found out the liver contains rage. That was very helpful for me to know that when your liver is kind of harboring a lot of these emotions or other, other organs are harboring emotions, that it creates stagnant energy, stagnant chi in the body, which can result in stagnation of, for instance, in my case, the uterus. And what I started noticing is that through these, a lot of these somatic practices that you taught um, last year, that and also through um, beginning like a jade egg practice. And if I don't have a jade egg, you know, you can just use your fingers. It's all good. Oh, yeah. It's oh, all yeah. good. I sometimes I have, prefer that. It's, uh, me too. I actually wrote on my 20, my 2024 goals list to masturbate once a week minimum on my minimum. own. So the, yeah. So 52 times. And I'm literally like putting a little tally on my little oh, annual that. paper. Yeah. And it's like, okay, if I don't do this uh, at least once a week, I'm going to be really well fucked at the end of the year when I'm trying to catch up and <laughs> doing this. Yeah, show. exactly. So, <laughs> like, I don't want to have to catch up or maybe I do. Hmm. Mm, Just like end way. the year in a bang. But through these practices, I've noticed that my menstrual cramps have subsided and um, I had a, a miscarriage last year, uh, towards the end of last year. And it was actually uh, in no way a pleasurable experience, but it was a very meaningful one. And I think thanks to a lot of the tools I had, it wasn't traumatic at all um, mm. because I just felt so connected to the flow of life, which includes the flow of death. And yeah. there's something about a relationship with the feminine inside of ourselves that allows us to experience these ebbs and flows. Anyway, I could talk about that forever, oh my but God. Yeah. I wanted to ask you kind of a question and maybe we can both answer it is we're going to talk about a, a masterclass that Shana and I are going to be hosting in March. Um, but even if you don't attend, I still want you to get a lot out of this. If you are someone that is experiencing dread around sex with your healthy, loving partner, what are some things that one can do to start to shift that pattern? Great question. Well, <clears throat> the first is to, um, as to the best of your ability to avoid judging yourself and, or your partner, just seeing things for what they are is the first step. You know, it's, it's so easy to make things into a problem. <clears throat> I find that when I make something into a problem, um, it's, much more difficult to find a solution, even though there may be a desire to transform that situation. So the first thing is to just take a breath and say, all right, this is where I am and I'm going to start where I am. Mm -hmm. um, some, and we'll go into this, of course, deeper when we, um, when we do the masterclass, but I'd say right now, when you're, if, and when you're experiencing that um, is to, first of all, mm, check in with yourself in terms of what is your relationship with your own pleasure? And we talked about this a little bit today, but do you know your own pleasure? I, 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 as much as I want to go into relating and relationships and, you know, uh, healing that it all starts with self and self pleasure. So when you share about your weekly <clears throat> masturbation meditation, <laughs> I say, <laughs> Hey, I say, uh, it's, it's just as, if not more important, as mentioned earlier, to carve out time to be with yourself intimately. Uh, so this is something first and foremost, so that you don't end up feeling resentful or you don't end up feeling like you're just doing it for someone else. I mean, this will play into that. You have a solo sexual self-care practice of your own. And so you're bringing that Mm, that inner knowing, that pleasure, that filled up tank to another so that you're not expecting them necessarily to do something for you, as mentioned, also asking for what you want. If something doesn't feel good or if you need more of something or if you would like some extra foreplay or some slowing down, it is very common and I, it, it depends on the person, but generally speaking for women, I know for my former self to even have a voice around sex and sexuality. And so even if I don't really like something, I just kind of endure it. If you ever feel like you are just enduring something, that's a moment to say, Hey, you know, what about trying this? Or I would really love it if you could do this. And let me just say, 
you know, because there could be a fear around disappointing another person, which also can cause a lot of sex anxiety because then it's like, okay, I'm just going to be here and I'm not in my pleasure and I'm totally in my head. If I'm not liking something and I'm just kind of waiting for it to be over, like, let's talk about disconnect. Uh, <clears throat> there's something around guiding your partner in a mindful way. This is where, you know, nonviolent communication comes in. Again, not shaming them for doing something wrong. They don't know. Again, right. every human being is completely unique. They're doing the best they can. They're doing what they know that you might not even realize how much your partner would appreciate your loving guidance. Hey, babe, you know, I really love, I, I, I appreciate what you're doing. And why don't you try this? And you can show them. But again, if you don't know your own pleasure or your own turn on, really, how can you expect them to? Right. And of course, some you know partners, you, they're more intuitive. They may, you know, have some skills, but there's really more to discover when you discover yourself first. Um, <clears throat> definitely slowing down um, is something that I find is great. And also, I want to just point to there's so much here and we can dive into this definitely. But I want to point it out to something really, really important is to let go of well, two things. One is to let go of the goal, to let go of there having to be an outcome. I feel that expectations in all senses of the word, but especially around sex and sexuality uh, <clears throat> can prevent us from being present in the moment because we're always trying to get somewhere, whether that's yeah. an orgasm for yourself or for the other person um, or some sort of a peak experience. In fact, in Tantra, we actually want to be able to remain in elevated states of arousal for an extended period of time, which means that we want to actually become, we want to heighten our sensitivity, become more sensitive and feel more. Meaning it's not just about the genitals, it's the whole body, you and your partner. So learning how to become more sensitive, meaning what if instead of the, I want to say pressure, especially if you do feel stressed out about sex and sexuality, what if you decided to just be sensual? There's a big difference of exploring each other's bodies and looking for those erogenous zones and you know, feeding each other chocolate and looking into each other's eyes and just even cuddling and letting that be enough. Having a conversation, of course, communicating boundaries and letting that be enough. One more that I'll share right now, because of course there's plenty more, mm -hmm. um, is... <sighs> You know, I, I don't know about you, but I know I, there's always this feeling of obligation to reciprocate and because, you know, sex and sex anxiety, you know, there's a lot that falls under this umbrella is like, are we talking about intercourse? Are we talking about oral sex? Are we talking about kissing? You know, there's so much that really can fall under this. And so some beautiful tantric practices are one person is the giver and one person is the receiver. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to pour the love on you. And we're consciously moving into this dynamic so that there's no expectations to return the favor. And there's a lot less pressure that way. And so you, let's say uh, the, the woman <clears throat> is the receiver and the, the man, let's just say binary terms for the sake of explanation is the giver. It's very clear. Therefore, you can just practice as the woman, you can practice the art of receiving and filling your personal pleasure tank. And the man is the space holder and serving. And then you switch. And it's actually really good, not just for compatibility and easing stress around the bedroom and sexuality, but it also gives you a chance to practice being in your feminine and your masculine or your yin and your yang energies, which can also support you in your life outside of the bedroom, you know, of learning how to be in that role of holding the space and initiating and also being in that space of allowing. So it's it's a really beautiful dance, pun intended. It is a dance. Mm -hmm. And those are the those are some of the examples I'd give. And I'd I'd love to hear some more of of from you also. Oh yeah. I think the the main and those are those were very beautiful. And I'm actually glad you didn't share the ones that I wanted to share. <laughs> that, that way it makes it easier. But the one of the things that was very mind blowing for me was the power of a ritual and yes. how, when you first started dating and you were in the honeymoon phase, 
a lot of what made your sex potentially so good was the fact that you really prepared for it. You didn't just, because my husband and I didn't know, we, we fell prey to the myth that if you're with the right partner, you know, you'll just be able to do it anytime and you'll be happy about it. (laughs) And that is not true. And what we would, what, what inevitably would, would happen is we would find ourselves in bed at the end of the day, exhausted. I want to go to sleep. He wants to have sex. Um, fortunately this dynamic doesn't really happen anymore, but there were good years where that was the pattern. And I would get into bed and I'd be anxious worrying about him initiating and he'd be anxious worrying that I'm going to, I'm going to reject him. Mm. And both of us thought there was something wrong with us or we weren't compatible. Um, not realizing that when you don't have a transition between real life and sex, it's kind of like driving a hundred miles an hour on the freeway. And then expecting to pull into the driveway at zero miles an hour, you're going to go from a hundred to zero. Really? Come on. No, in real life, you would get off the freeway and you would go from 80 miles an hour to 55. And then you would go into a residential area and you'd go to 25 miles an hour. And then you'd pull into your driveway at like two, two miles an hour and come to a complete stop in your home, which could be metaphorically called your body. So the mind runs a hundred miles an hour. And if you're going to expect to transition from hundred percent in your mind to hundred percent in your body in a matter of seconds, when you <laughs> happen to arrive in bed, good luck. I don't care good how luck. compatible, I don't care how compatible you are. You need to create a transition space from the mind into the body. And so early on, when I was in my early twenties, my aunt told me like, if you know, you're going to have sex later that day start preparing four hours before groom yourself, take a shower, like lotion your body. Don't watch the news 20 minutes before the act, right? Don't do things that deliberately put you into a sympathetic state. And so I did, I would like put on soft music. I would do a somatic practice. And for a while, that's, that's how I did things. And it was hard, Shana. It was hard for me to have the discipline to Mm -hmm. slow down because it felt unproductive. And I had all this conditioning around deserving pleasure and deserving space in my life to enjoy. So that was, but that was kind of my ritual. At first it was a ritual that I just did for myself. My husband was too stressed out to even consider doing that type of thing, but I had to put myself in a, in a state of mind and a state of body to be ready to receive him literally potentially. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, that that brought things from really bad to less bad <laughs> and then eventually it got to okay and you know also your partner needs to be willing to do some work on their end and um you know i had to tell my partner do you think would you, would you be willing to take a shower before <laughs> you, we yeah. make love would you yeah. be willing to clean the dirt under your nails from work before you stick your fingers in my vagina <laughs> would you be willing to file like file your nails before you touch me right things like that so yeah. obviously he meant no harm by that it's he's he's prioritizing other things and i'm very grateful that he's prioritizing so it took us a long time to um realize the importance of of foreplay and foreplay is not just 5 minutes of kissing before you have sex yeah. um and it took and at the same time i i didn't find it helpful to like try to lecture my my now husband on this stuff, he had to kind of discover this on his own and discover that, um, you know, if you, if you linger with me on a kiss for five seconds earlier on in the day, it's going to excite me a lot more. And I don't think he understood how important I'm very turned on by lingering. If you, if you linger with me to the point where it's almost awkward, but not quite there, it's a, (laughs) you know, I'm very turned on by linger. That's why I love Argentine tango because it doesn't follow a specific rhythm. And Argentine tango was a huge part of my sexual awakening because I, I'm actually turned on by music, especially really rich, rich multidimensional music with a lot of, with a lot of complex harmonies. Um, And that was a really interesting thing for me where I would actually masturbate to like, weird music <laughs> so, oh. but it's like so cool and it's it's I guess it's a little kink and I had to you know use that in my own self-pleasure practice and over time through tango I learned how the power of the linger and I told Preston that you know if you linger with me when in a kiss on your way out the door I'm gonna want you later yeah <laughs> okay oh. 
So just take that extra two seconds and look me in the eyes and, and like breathe with me for five seconds yeah. and then leave and then leave me and, and don't give me what I want all the time. Let me, let me want sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So things, the conversations like this, it took us 12 years to really get to a point where, um, I don't dread sex anymore. There are absolutely times when I have sex and it's not like outstanding and I'm just kind of doing it as an, as an act of love, as a service, as an exercise. Um, but I think in order to do that, you need to clear a lot of your emotions around sex where it doesn't feel like a threat to your nervous system to have sex. So nowadays I can do a quickie when I'm not turned on and it doesn't really bother me. But back then I didn't have enough self-loving practices to where I could afford to give myself in that way. So I yeah. guess my the power of ritual is very important. Whether you're whether the ritual is foreplay or you you have an agreed upon ritual that you're going to do before you have before you make love, um, or or some kind of other practice, um, or it's a ritual that you do on your own before you say, "Okay, honey, I'm ready for you." Like I have literally done that, <laughs> um, and then he comes in and we begin. So we're um, we are going to be offering um a ritual that you can do with your partner in the sex anxiety masterclass. So if you guys are interested, um definitely come. It's going to be beautiful. Yeah. And that's kind of my tip is, you know, create way more transition space to slow down. Yes. So, yeah. I yeah. love I love the analogy of getting off the highway. That's so perfect. Thank you. I came up with it myself. Oh, girl, <laughs> that is so perfect. That is literally it. Um, and yeah, I think it's amazing. And ritual in you know, Tantra is all about ritual and Tantra is all about making the mundane into something more meaningful and even sacred. And so this applies to of course, sex and anything and everything in life so that we can really live a more fulfilling, rich, harmonious, uh, meaningful life. So yeah, I'm really, really excited to share the ritual that we're going to uh, be bringing into the masterclass as well as um, just a lot more of how sex anxiety shows up because sometimes it's subtle oh, yeah. uh, and, you know, it's subtle and where it comes from and how to clear it once and for all so that you can step into your full power as a sexual and creative being. Beautiful. And I also feel called to make this to articulate this because we've mentioned the word conscious and consciousness a few times. Yeah. And in this context, um, what I, when I think of conscious doing something consciously, I mean that you are doing something deliberately as opposed to waiting for it to happen to you or waiting for it to happen. Uh, yes. Right. So when we end up in bed and one of us says, so should we do it? That's not conscious. You didn't plan it. It wasn't deliberate. You just ended up there and hoped that it would be something. Conscious would be meet me in the bedroom at 9 p.m. Yes, absolutely. Like the scheduling. Right. And yeah, that's you know, now intentional and not random. Exactly. Exactly. And that's that's super important. Uh, it's it's you know, it just makes a big difference because as mentioned, it's not random, it's you're creating it. Uh, with conscious sexuality, I also put that into the category of uh, free from substance. Um, mm -hmm. Just, you know, as it's important, I know for my former self, you know, before I went into my deep celibate phase, I was very sexual, as mentioned, and I don't even remember half of it because I was drunk. And so you can't really be connected. You weren't really there. I wasn't there at all. So there's, you know, I've been doing a lot of healing around FOMO, <laughs> literally of feeling like I really missed out. Um, and of course, when, you know, I, drunk sex, you know, it, it could lead to a lot of trauma. And I know that it did for me for sure, because I'm sure I was taken advantage of. I don't remember it. I was doing things just for other people. Um, and I was kind of like, here, just take me and, you know, blacked out half the time. So it's, wow. you, you know, you, you can't be present or conscious, so to speak, when you are under the influence. So just, I need to just put that in here because I know that, you know, having a drink or doing something to kind of take the edge off can be easily justified by the mind. And the invitation is to 
allow yourself to feel what you feel using your breath, using sound. We're going to get more into this during the master class, but really using your body as a tool to, I want to say, transmute, transform this energy that you call anxiety in your body. And actually that same energy that we start to move and connect with more consciously um, can actually become like a natural high, if you will. And mm -hmm. in a lot of the tantric practices, um, they strongly encourage refraining from all substances, even including caffeine. I don't follow that rule, but because <laughs> sexual energy is such a powerful energy that when we, you know, when we really get in touch with it in a more present way, mindful way, um, it can really be a kind of a, a naturally psychedelic experience. So um, just let that be the curiosity. Mm, thank you for saying that. And I think that anxiety is potentially excitement in disguise. If it's, oh. if it is alchemized in a different way, that sensitivity that you, you, that drives you nuts and makes it feel like nails grating on a chalkboard, um, that sensitivity can be alchemized into a very useful tool for pleasure. So it's, it's just about rerouting the focus to, to something that's more nourishing. 1000%. Yeah. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about the masterclass. And then uh, Shana also is running the same training that I attended last year. And I would love for the you guys who are listening to know about it, because if you resonate with my, with my stuff and my story, um, this is a continuation of that. And I, I want you guys to know about this. So um, the Sex Anxiety Masterclass is going to be on March 14th at 2 p.m. Pacific time and 5 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to include a link in the show notes. And we'll go We'll go for about an hour and a half. Um, the things we're going to be covering is very much in alignment with what we've been covering today. We're going to talk about uh, myths around sex and debunking, debunking these myths around sex and intimacy that are causing you to feel ashamed and disconnected. Um, we'll help you identify and release resistance to intimacy and desire. Um, I talked a little about uh, today about ritual. So I want to give you, we're going to give you some strategies to get turned on outside of the bedroom without burdening your partner with the task of making you feel alive and sexy and turned on. Um, we're going to talk about how to handle awkwardness and discomfort. Um, so really what, what we would love is for you to, um, be able to look forward to sex and, and not be panicking whenever, um, you know, sex is mediocre or panicking if things don't go your way. We'd love for you to be able to really rediscover your pleasure and your sensuality in a, in a new way um, and expand your capacity for pleasure and abundance because um, sexuality and abundance and pleasure and uh, opportunities coming your way, it's all, it's all very connected to your ability to receive. So I, I would love for that to happen for you in the way that it's happening for me. And as a fun side effect, um, when you're connected to your pleasure, you can become more magnetic and inspiring. And so my hope is that um, this kind of energy can inspire your partner to grow and change and be excited to take care of you in the bedroom. Um, and also, I think it would be very powerful for you to discover um basically like a, a piece because you can finally step out of the constant comparisons uh, to, to fantasy land scenarios mm -hmm. like social yeah. media and porn and Disney and Hollywood drama and all that stuff. So it's going to be very rich. We'll spend about 30 minutes um, discussing sex anxiety and what how it's created and what you can do about it. Um, and then we'll teach you a ritual that you can um, do with your partner. You can share it with your partner. And then Shana is going to actually lead an embodied practice that you can do solo to circulate orgasmic energy and pleasure and release trauma and shame. So it's going to be really delicious. And mm. after that, we'll follow it up with, um, with some Q and a, and, and Shana can also talk about, um, the embodied wisdom Academy. So that's, that is the, um, sex anxiety masterclass. Oh, and I should mention that, um, this masterclass is going to be part of my both feet in abridged curriculum, which I'm currently running with about 50 women. Um, they are all getting free access to this masterclass, but I'm also opening it up to the public. It's going to be 33 sweet dollars and I'll include the, sh the link in the show notes. So be sure to, um, find that and sign up and, and grab your spot 
And if you can't make it, no worries. You can still enroll. I'm going to be sending out the recording to anyone that had registered. So that is that. Is there anything you want to add about that, Shana? Yum. No, I'm just so excited. I think it's yeah, just- Me like, too. Yeah. yeah just, so it's needed. Just, so needed. I think it's it's really time. So yeah, if you're yep. feeling called, then I definitely suggest joining us. It's going to be magic. It is. And as someone who can speak- um, who, who madly adores her partner and, and knows that my partner is, is the person I want to do life with. He is, I don't want to say the one, but he is a one that I have chosen. And <laughs> as someone who has experienced, um, dread in the bedroom for years and doesn't really experience it anymore. Um, I can tell you that this work is very transformative and, I highly recommend go, learning these things sooner than later because like your stock, what am I thinking? Like your brokerage account, not brokerage, like your investments, like your financial investments, mm. your sex education is an investment. Don't learn this stuff when you're older because the stuff that you can learn about sex is literally infinite and your knowledge compounds. So these rituals, I didn't know anything about them until literally seven years ago. And that's when I started to be a little bit more intentional about sex, scheduling sex, all of these things. And I just barely touched the jade egg seven years ago for the first time. And still, I feel like a baby, like a newborn learning these mm -hmm. things. And I just, I think the sooner you can start, the better, because these, the pleasure compounds just like any other investment in your time Absolutely. and energy, when you, when you invest time, energy, and money into learning about your pleasure and your body, it's kind of like watering the seed of a big tree, like a sequoia. At first, it's going to be a little sapling and you're going to be watering it a lot in the beginning. Right. It's very intentional, but give it 10 years, 20 years, and you won't need to water it as much because it's really established. So I recommend sooner than later, learning about these tools, especially if this is all new to you and you've been, you've fallen victim to the, uh, the myths that mm -hmm. our society keeps perpetuating. If you fall in myths to that, it's time to step outside of it and, and be liberated. So this masterclass is going to be a really great starting point for you. And my hope is that if, if my stuff, if Shana's stuff is really resonating with you, go, go to her certification program. Um, it's, it's been a really powerful tool in my toolbox and I can't recommend it highly enough. So without further ado on that, um, I hope to see you in the, in the masterclass. And also I'm going to open up for Shana to, to talk about her work for those of you that want to hear about it. And yeah, you can take the floor on it, Shana. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to say one thing about what you said is, uh, I just wanted to say this to anyone listening is you are wired for pleasure. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say that because for so many years, I held a belief that was incredibly convincing that I really, really believed that I just wasn't wired for it. It just wasn't possible for me because I was literally numb and or there was pain. There was so much pain in my body. And so I didn't want to feel that pain. Therefore, I did not tend to my body for many years until I started learning the Tao Tantric arts, which is what I teach on my trainings and on my retreats, which essentially is about meeting pain with love and thereby transforming it and building new pleasure pathways through intention, through intentional touch, through embodied self-love, through somatic practices. And just as you have attested to the power of this work on so many levels, I can't even begin to describe, I mean, I, I literally believe that I was broken and I'm not. And I'm, I, I feel, I now can say with full conviction that I have an orgasmic womb. And what I mean by that is like, even just a gentle touch on the outside, of my womb space, the outside of my lower abdomen, like I can start to feel that flutter of pleasure. And internally, I never thought it was possible for me. I had so much pain. I had a prolapsed uterus at some point. So I had a big blockage. I couldn't even put anything inside of my vagina. So it was like, 
I'm, I'm, and it was truly the jade egg practice, learning about my pelvic floor, clearing trauma and shame. If you've ever heard of um, the term, I remember I first heard this term coined by my first yoga teacher in 2005, your issues are in your tissues. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. oh, I can't just solve my issues through thinking and talking. I have to actually go into my body. And that's what, of course, we're going to be sharing in the masterclass. And that's basically what I teach. In addition to yoga, yoga is important. Yoga is like the container and these tantric practices and these more feminine practices, I want to say, are like the liquid there to really cultivate this energy. And uh, so this is everything that I share and teach. I have a one week retreat for women that happens yearly this year. It's again in Bali. You were there last year. That's May 18th to the 25th. And we have a second week, which is the facilitator training. And that is by interview. Um, we will determine if that feels like a good fit. And basically the way that I designed this two week course is the first week is a retreat. Meaning if you're just curious, you just want to reset connect with women, learn some new practices, um, have an amazing time in Bali, come for one week and nourish yourself. If you are curious to maybe add some more tools to your toolbox, deepen your practice, begin a career serving other women uh, on their healing journey, then stay for the second week. The first week is all about receiving. You talked about this earlier and the importance of learning how to receive for you know, magnifying abundance in all aspects of our lives. The first week is you're actually learning the teachings in your body. You're experiencing them. You're totally receiving. The second week is when you learn how to teach and facilitate the practices that you experience during week one. So it's not a theoretical training where you're just learning something through the mind and memorizing it and regurgitating it. You're learning it through the body and tapping into your true authentic voice, your unique healing energy, if you will. So it's also an empowerment training for those of you who are in service-oriented roles. We have people from, you know, you name it, coaches, yoga teachers, healers, corporate women, women in the military. Uh, there's so much uh, that this can feed. By the way, it, doctors come to these trainings. Doctors, and it's amazing. Yes. Doctors yes, and therapists. Have, yes, so doctors cool. and therapists. It's amazing. And, 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 you know, when I speak to the women who have attended this training, whether or not they go on to actually teach, I do certify you in various modalities, including uh, the jade egg practice, breast massage, energetic womb clearing. We work a lot around the sacral chakra and the womb space to clear trauma and shame and to regenerate that that space as a space of creativity. And once that happens, I mean, we had a woman on the training. Well, she actually wasn't even on the training. She just came for the retreat, but she got so activated on the retreat that she started a, a home organizing business. So it might not even fall under the same you know, yeah. category as, oh, I want to help women. It, it'll enhance and inspire whatever your creative or professional pursuits are. So this energy is the energy of life and creativity. So whatever you intend on it, you know, bringing forth in your life, it will. But if you do come for two weeks, you will be certified to mentor women on their healing journey. So if you're curious, um, we can definitely share more. Amazing. Thank you so much yeah. for sh sharing, Shana. You're so welcome. Oh, Thank I have little tingles running up and down my spine. I feel so good to, to be sharing this amazing oh. these tools with people um and to to share you as well so uh the master class will be on march 14th i will put the link to register below if you are in both feet in a bridge this is complimentary you do not need to pay for it i also i don't think i mentioned this before but this master class is open to all even though we spoke a lot about women's sexuality today it is open to men women um, non-binary the somatic practices that we do are going to be quite gender neutral. So you do not need to have a womb. You can, they will still be very pleasure centered and, and focused on activating aliveness and transforming emotions. So by all means, please feel free to attend the, um, the retreat though is, is for women. 
So if you yes. are interested, I will put the both links in the show notes and a way for you to contact Shana and, uh, and your Instagram also. Can Perfect. you share that with us? Yes, it's Shana Hiller. It's my name at Shana Hiller, S-H-A-Y-N-A-H-I-L-L-E-R. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank oh. you so much. This is magic. You are welcome. Everyone feels so nourished. Yes, me too. Is there anything else that you want to share or would like our audience to know? I think that's all. Just, you know, keep tending to your pleasure and um, and join us for the masterclass. <laughs> yes, it's going to be beautiful. There was a, a question that surfaced in my mind uh, while I was walking down those bajillion steps at Bagus Jati last year, the <laughs> retreat center. And it was this question I I actually have been asking myself this question um, nonstop ever since very often. And it's not, it's not a question that demands an answer. It's just a question that invites a new perspective, a wordless type of perspective. And the question is, where is the pleasure right now? Mm. Mm. Ah, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's a great pleasure? one to just be with, to just be with yeah. that question. When I'm in my like, Uber and the wind's on my face, where is the pleasure? Yeah. 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 So it's just such a, it's a wonderful question to start with and ask yourself, because you will find it if you look. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. shifting the direction of the mind to pleasure will start to shift the direction of the life. So it's a beautiful starting point. Yep. All right, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And we hope to see you in the masterclass and uh, toodaloo. <laughs> Toodaloo. <laughs> bye for now. Bye, bye, bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Anxious Love Coach today. If you loved this episode, please hit that subscribe button, leave a review, and follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, and maybe share it with someone that you believe might benefit from these perspectives. Please also subscribe to my email list at www.anxiouslovecoach.com as I'm trying to reduce my reliance on social media. In exchange, you will receive my free relationship anxiety meditation and more supportive tools sent your way. If you would like to work with me, head on over to my website at, again, anxiouslovecoach.com to explore different tiers of coaching options and online programs. Thanks again for listening and catch you in the next episode. Have a blessed day.